you've heard from some very impressive people uh, already today, and you've heard some talk about you know, incredibly powerful forces, but I think that you, you should know that probably the one individual who has been more responsible for costing the American economy more money than any other human being in the history of the world is Dan Okrant, who is getting ready to A few years ago, he went to a restaurant in New York called La Rotisserie Francoise. Am I correct about that? Francaise. Francaise. <laughs> yes, sorry. And on that day, created what was called Rotisserie Baseball which has turned into fantasy sports. And uh, the idea that they came up with was not just the idea of fantasy sports, but the management of fantasy sports teams, which I would say, how many man hours do you estimate has been lost at uh, managing fantasy sports on work time, Dan? Would you? S well, if I had a penny for each one, Zillions. I mean, <laughs> the new statistical abstract of the U.S. said the more people play that than play chess. No. Uh, well, among his many achievements, I'm Dan sorry. is, uh, as I know, all of you know, is uh, the first public editor of the New York Times, a, a terrific uh, writer. Uh, his book Prohibition on Prohibition has just been uh, republished in a way that sort of got, gotten second life at any event. He came from a magazine background to the New York Times, having never worked at a newspaper before, but made the first public editorship one that has never been matched, uh, and did something for that institution that is enduringly important. I'm very glad to say that he then came to the Shorenstein Center and uh, has been a great friend of the Shorenstein Centers and all of us up here for the, all the years since. Uh, welcome, and uh, when I talked to Dan about doing this, I said, who would you like to interview? And there's no question who he wanted to interview, Adam Moss. Thank you, Alex, and thank you all for staying here for the last event of the day. It's not a great place to be in the program, but we'll take it. Uh, I, met Adam, uh, I met Adam Moss uh, in the early 80s. What year did you get to Esquire, was it? 82. Uh, when he was around 11 years old and was a, was a, <laughs> was a fact checker there. You're, it's and already wrong. <laughs> well, okay. wasn't a fact. Okay. He, he, he was a junior guy. There you go. And uh, <laughs> very, 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 very junior. And, and I needed a fact checker to. <laughs> um, and uh, incredibly impressive. I mean, this guy just had magazines kind of, you know, uh, coursing through his blood. And, and I asked a colleague uh, who knew him well. I was a columnist for the magazine at the time, and just was occasionally in the office. Um, you know. Tell me about this kid Moss. And they say, well, we don't know whether anybody's gone from being a junior editor to being editor in chief overnight, but he'll be the one to do it. And though he didn't do it at Esquire, uh, he did rise very rapidly and then started his own magazine in the late 80s <coughs> called Seven Days. Those of us who lived in New York in the late 80s and early 90s know what a great magazine that was. Like many great magazines, it therefore went out of business. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Adam went to the Times first as editorial director and then as the chief editor of the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Uh, who, and I believe that at, during Adam's tenure at the, the magazine, he did that amazing thing, which is he actually made me look forward to reading the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Um, he was in that job and then <coughs> advanced to being the assistant managing editor for features for the whole newspaper and then left to New York Magazine, where he is the editor in chief today and has been for seven years. And. Uh, I think the, the extraordinary accomplishment, Adam's accomplishment, that of his colleagues at New York Magazine, is that they, they, they took the most tired, the most uh, exhausted and desiccated uh, 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 formula in magazine publishing, that of the city and regional magazine, and they invented something utterly new. I think it's a truly great magazine. The, uh, those of you who don't read it ought to. Those of you who used to read it and gave up on it ought to pick it up again. Uh, the National Magazine Awards, uh, the magazine business equivalent of the Pulitzers, uh, have belonged to New York Magazine since Ad Adam became editor, including winning five in one year, uh, which had never been done before and will never be done again until Adam does it again. So, Damn. therefore, now here's the <laughs> now it gets harder. Uh, uh, so, uh, thanks for coming, Adam. Um, Thank you. The, one of the things, uh, what, what I'd like to talk about first is 
the, uh, the, ve the very bizarre fact, given magazine economics, that New York Magazine seems to be doing more and more political coverage, serious political coverage, uh, uh, almost more and more with each, each issue, hiring some very well-known people to, to do it. And the surprising thing, for those of you who are not familiar with the magazine business, is that, that there's nothing that sells worse in magazines. Uh, in general interest magazines, politics is poison. At, at, at People magazine, um, back, believe it or not, in the 1970s, people would actually have cabinet secretaries on the cover every so often, <laughs> senators. Uh, there was a formula that it said, what's the best, television sells better than music, music sells better than movies, movie sells better than sports, and everything sells better than politics. And you're adding politics to your magazine. How is it happening? Well, we're um, sort of accidentally. It's not that there's any sort of great uh, strategic plan to it. Although, uh, part of what happened is that we, New York Magazine has always had politics in its formula. Uh, it was improbable. It was a city magazine, but Clay Felker, who started the magazine, just really was interested in national politics and also felt that, you know, given the fact that the real subject of New York was what New Yorkers thought about as opposed to the city itself, um, they were deeply invested in the political life of the country. So Richard Reeves and Gloria Steinem, who used to be actually be a great political reporter, um, you know, established this, this franchise. So there was this thing called the National Interest, was a column, uh, and uh, when I got there, or shortly after I got there, uh, I was talking to John Heilman, um, who had been a writer mostly on technology, a little bit on politics, um, and uh, asked him if he wanted to do this. And, and uh, he started to cover politics regularly, and he was very popular. Um, and uh, his coverage of the uh, 2008 campaign, which later became uh, <coughs> Uh, with Mark Helper in the book Game Change, um, some just amazing journalism, and and uh, and started to, you know, when we put a political figure on the cover, it actually did start to work for us. Now a lot of this was that that election was, you know, it was a pop election in a lot of ways, and uh, you know when you when you would alternate covers on Hillary Clinton and and Barack Obama, those covers would sell, um, and they, those covers sold really really well, and. Um, <coughs> And, and John was good, and he told stories, which is, I think, the main thing that people started to read it for. It wasn't, it wasn't political analysis, per se. It was more uh, sort of opening the curtain and showing you what was actually going on in the room, which actually had been the theme of the magazine you know, entirely anyway, whether you're looking at restaurants or looking at business or looking in, in, in any other place that, that has a door. Um, so we just sort of opportunistically followed John. His, you know, Obama sold fantastically. I mean, we're talking in business terms, which is not ha actually totally how we saw this, but he, Obama did sell incredibly well every time we put him on the cover. Hillary sold incredibly well every time we put her on the cover. Sarah Palin sold incredibly well uh, every time we put her on the cover. McCain, not so much. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, but that sort of established for us uh, a franchise. The fact that his book was such a phenomenon didn't hurt. Um, the fact that then he started to sort of inspire other feature writers at the magazine, um, uh, Joe Hagan and Gabe Sherman, um, to do much the same thing until uh, the magazine's coverage of politics began to be described actually as game change style um, political reporting, which really, uh, really meant politics as narrative, politics as storytelling. Um, and that was just a very successful franchise for us. Um, and that was how we did it for a while. And then, and then Frank Rich. And then Frank Rich. So talk about Frank Rich. Another, another kind of accident. Um, you know, Frank is, uh, is someone who I've known for a long time. I, used to, I, I published him at Esquire. Um, you know, we worked together off and on at the New York Times. He was a, a staff writer for the magazine for a little bit. Um, and then when I was promoted into that sort of ridiculous job, um, overseeing stuff. Uh, he and I um, did a version of what culture coverage ought to be at the, at the paper and, and presented it to uh, Bill Keller and, and Jill Abramson at the time. And, um, and Frank called me up. He was ready to do something else other than the New York Times. And he wanted my advice on, uh, on where he should go next. And he had a couple of places he was thinking of going next. And I said, well, why don't you come here? And uh, it hadn't occurred to him at all. <laughs> um, but we started to talk about it. And um, 
I, I made a proposal to him of a certain kind of coverage, which would be a monthly essay and, and sort of weekly chats online. Uh, and, uh, and he decided to come. And, and so he brought frank richness to the table, <laughs> well, which was, uh, yeah, go. Well, well, let me get into the frank richness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, and, and I'm dwelling on the business aspect mm -hmm. only because the anomaly right. of, I mean, I think it applies in broadcast as well. Politics is not something that, it, that, that is usually commercially successful, and it has been for you. Uh, and I had assumed, and when you brought <laughs> Frank over, that, well, Frank, if any columnist in America who writes about politics has the following, it's Frank Rich, and he would bring his readers over. But I remember you were telling me in a conversation we had uh, you know, about two months after Frank was there, that it really had an effect on advertising. Well, I mean, it did in a couple of different ways. I mean, first of all, Frank, you know, I hate to use this word, but I mean, he is a brand. Um, and, you know, what that, that means in journalistic terms is that he has this, he does have a, you know, a bunch of readers who will follow him anywhere. Um, and, uh, and he has a reputation. I mean, it was, he was a sort of perfect fit for New York Magazine for the sort of, uh, political mindset, the sort of, you know, if you want to um, reduce it to a sort of Upper West Side kind of, um, you know, liberally uh, mindset, he was, he, he, was the, he was the perfect, it was perfect casting in a sense. Um, but he also had a, uh, a constituency of people who control ad dollars um, and, uh, you know, people who wanted to be where Frank was. They actually believed the proposition, the old proposition in journalism, that when you have, uh, you have someone who brings readers over, when you have readers' eyes, you can actually also sell ads to them. So that there was, there was that category of advertising that we got that was like people, you know, people like um, you know, the, the Book of Mormon um, you know, was trying to advertise in, the, in uh, was thinking of places to advertise in the magazine, and they thought that you know, Frank's readership would be a perfect Book of Mormon theater going public, um, and so bam, um, MSNBC. So some of that, some of the sort of natural, you know, uh, uh, obvious advertising that would come with Frank. But the other thing that happened is that the magazine, you know, our, um, our proposition has been, since I've gotten there, and uh, it, it has been a struggle uh, over other iterations of the magazine too, is to make the case that though our name is New York, um, in fact, we are a national magazine, and, and, and you know, in many ways, our circulation tells that story. In other ways, the circulation um, needs to be spun a little bit. Um, but the, you know, we are a magazine of national influence, and um, and you know, you can talk yourself blue in the face trying to you know tell a car company that that's the case, and and they just don't believe it because it just says New York on the cover. Bring Frank over, and it's like whoa. Frank Rich, he is a uh, he is a you know big Kahuna, and uh, and and so they started to see us as a national magazine, which o which opened up a whole category of national kinds of advertising. Yeah, I'll move away from the commercial aspect now. Okay. So your most recent hire that I'm aware of was Jonathan Shade from the uh, from the New Republic. Right. Uh, and um, I guess this isn't necessarily so about Heilman, but it seems to me that in the pages of your magazine, and certainly in the uh, attitudes presented by by both Rich and Chait, um, you use the term Upper West Side. There's an assumption that I perceive in the magazine that you have a readership of basically, you know, good, solid, left of center, solid liberal, maybe some to the further to the left, but it's a small community in a large forum, or, it's a, or uh, put it another way, unlike the National Review or the Nation, which have found their, their ideological com communities. Right. You have found a community, and then you realize, it's it, as if you realize that there is a common worldview that you're expressing, that it's less, you're, you're not presenting a spectrum of political coverage, you're, you're nailing a particular portion of your reading. Which is also more or less accidental. I mean, you know, everything that we do in the magazine is, uh, you know, is, is, is for a certain kind of reader, not every kind of reader. And, uh, and, and we have an idea of who the reader is, and among the reader's attributes is, is a certain um, range of political opinions. Now, that doesn't mean we don't want to challenge those political opinions. We like to do that often. But our, certainly our assumption is that we're talking to a certain kind of person. And, uh, and, and though we did not mean to um, become a partisan political magazine, we have kind of accidentally become that way, largely because of the power of prose, the power of journalism, the power of analysis. Um, that, you know, Frank, Fra Frank, 
Frank, who writes from an extremely uh, you know, uh, powerful, polemical point of view, sorry for that alliteration, um, uh, he, 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 his, he changes the magazine just by the virtue of him being there. We've just hired, so as you say, we've just hired Jonathan Chait, who, uh, who is just an amazingly um, smart, wonderful analyst, I mean just political analyst, whose politics are slightly, I think, more center than Frank's, but certainly, um, I mean, Frank is, has moved, I think, a little bit to the left when in the I, last several months. When I was months. at the Times and I, I claimed that I was kind of in the center, and they said, yeah, the island in the middle of Broadway in front of Zay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I mean, he's moved, he's moved a little more Krugman-like, I think, and away from, uh, you know, from the, the, the sort of, the, the place that he was when he started. Part, that, that doesn't have to do with him coming from the Times to us. It has to do with his own response to uh, this political climate that we're in. Um, but the thing, just to get back to business, because you're, I you know, guess, interested in that, um, is that, uh, so John Chait's job is to write daily on, um, on our site, which is now, I mean, you know, just in terms, of, in, in terms of the magazine company that we have, uh, our digital side is actually you know, quite a bit um, bigger in audience, certainly, than our uh, print side. And, 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 and is in a lot of ways the, you know, the future of what we're doing. We're really trying to build a um, major digital uh, uh, journalistic enterprise. And so John Chait is on every day, three times a day. His coming um, has uh, exploded the readership of the uh, site. And um, his stuff, which is, you know, it's, it's like, it's hardcore political analysis. The stuff that, you know, yeah, if you were People Magazine, would not work for you. Here, it's working incredibly well for us. Um, and what's more, it has, you know, we, we uh, and you know, you can measure that. That's the amazing thing about uh, the digital community. And, and, and uh, you know, in print, you make guesses all the time about what people actually want. Um, Online, for better and for worse, you can count those. You know, you can you can count response. And so when you, you, you when John Chait writes something, bam, <coughs> readership uh, readership soars, and that actually has an economic um, benefit for us as well. The other thing that it's done though is that we have you know we're um, we have a fairly active commenting community uh, who are you know. Um, not necessarily in all cases the kind of people that you want talking about your material. Um, a lot of them are, um, you know, it's it's it, it's been a, it's been a less less than high-minded discourse. Let's just say. Really. Uh, it's sh shocking. But John has actually changed the discourse all across the site. That suddenly in the last three weeks, um, the uh, amount of commenting, the amount of community, and and the amount of engagement. Um, and the, frankly, I mean, this is just my own subjective. There's no way to subject this to uh, any kind of metric, but you just look at it, and, and, and the conversation's smarter. And so, you know, it's having, it's having an effect all over the place. So what's coming up, then? You have something? You have so, yeah, well, so that we're, you know, we're, we, we've now found ourselves, and this, again, this is, like, we're completely opportunistic. We hired Hallman, we hired Frank. Um, and then John Chait became available, and I was just a huge John Chait fan, and we went after him when he kind of was in play. And then we suddenly woke up about a month ago and realized that we had these three powerhouse talents um, uh, writing about politics for us, um, and we published them, um, you know, in, in, in different intervals. Um, uh, and then on the site itself, we have these sort of younger writers, this guy named Dan Amira and this other woman named Noreen Malone writing about politics who also, uh, their stuff was starting to accumulate a kind of um, volume of readership that was really exciting. But our site itself is such a horizontal, um, you know, mix of stuff, you know, because we have a fashion site as part of this. We have a food site. We have an entertainment site um, <coughs> that, you know, we were afraid that people were not people were not really general interest readers anymore, and particularly not online. Um, and that you know that we were creating a tremendous identity confusion and having this hardcore political stuff along with you know restaurants, or even worse, like red carpet, uh, you know, party pictures. You're right. Um, worse. Even yeah. worse. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we are creating our, our own politics site, um, which we will do uh, basically you know, uh, 
one one year from the 12 election. Um, so that'll be in a few year weeks. before the yeah. So like November, whatever that date is, sixth, seventh, eighth. So when does the print magazine stop and it becomes strictly a, a digital enterprise? Not while I'm editor, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, the print, you know, we thought after the. Uh, financial crisis, which um, hit us pretty hard, like it hit uh, everyone pretty hard, that you know, pretty much print was not going to survive this. Um, we lost, just got socked in the stomach. We lost so much print business, print advertising business. Um, but what was happening was that the online business, which got hurt a little bit, was still actually doing pretty well. So we thought, all right, well, OK, we're, we're adjusting. We're going to become a digital company. The magazine you know, may not last very long. Um, but what happened is that as the recession eased up a little bit um, is that all this business started to flow back into the magazine. Um, and actually, we, you know, we did all these sort of tricks. We started to uh, sell the magazine for a lot more money. Uh, so people had to, they used to be able to pay really pittance for it. And now it actually costs something. Um, and we didn't lose any circulation. In fact, our circulation is very strong. Ad, we're having a best ad year um, since, since right before the recession. So I actually, you know, I can't speak for all of print, but, um, but I think the print magazine uh, is going to last for a little while. Well, a little while, I'll grant you. But eventually, I, mean, I think you would agree that we're moving toward the, the post-print era. I'm just wondering whether we The would, logic is that, yes. Wh 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 whether we get there or not, what's the distinction in the kind of uh, in journalism that you do online relative to the journalism that you do in print? Or is there no distinction? Well, sure there is. I mean, the stuff that you do originally, I mean, our, our, our collective websites, um, we're putting material up every, about every six minutes. Um, and we're writing overnight, and we're writing on the weekends, um, and we're functioning much more like a, a, a newspaper in that sense. Um, and 90% uh, of uh, our readership online is, is for original web content. That stuff is fast. It's shorter. Um, it tends to be more um, of a commentary type thing. It's, 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 it's a kind of aggregation. It's like aggregation plus. Um, we hope to add something as we move information around, but it's doing a lot of collating the interesting stuff that's going on all over the place. Um, so that's, you know, and, and we would like to be doing more if, you know, if we can, if eventually we'll be doing more original reporting on the web, um, although there, there's, there's all sorts of, you know, resource questions about it. If you have to produce so much content because the thing is so hungry, um, you can't liberate someone from their you know, blogging well, seed well, what, um, what, in order to do that. So doesn't that lead to commentary overwhelming reporting? Uh, yes, it does. And so that in, in, in some ways, a lot of what we're doing online is commentary. That's our business. However, the other thing I was going to say is that when we do, we now publish the magazine essentially, we publish it for the magazine readers, but we also publish it for the digital readers. So that the, um, the magazine stuff, which is much more obviously reported and deeper and, you know, people spend, you know, they can spend up to six months writing an article. That stuff, when we put it online, uh, is the most popular stuff we do. And um, the readership is huge for it. So that when we used to be publishing, if, if, uh, you, know, if, um, if you wrote an article uh, for the magazine, your audience was f the 400,000 print readers that we have. Now you write an article for the magazine, your audience is 10 million people. So um, because, my, because my, of the my, distribution. My potential audience. Your potential audience, yeah. right. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So, <laughs> Not you, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thanks, Ed. Uh, but but so, so it's available. But are they, are they reading it? I mean, yeah. I mean, not ten, not so all ten million so of them. So long long form. Long form is, is working. Yeah, it's working. Um, people are. You know, I don't. I don't know that they're actually reading it in front of a screen. Um, you know, uh, people read in all sorts of ways. They you know they save it to Instapaper. They print it out. They you know. Um, but the stuff has high readership. It's, it's popular content. So you'd be hiring more political people? Um, I think we're, you know, we're OK politically you know, for the moment. But you know, one of the, as I said, though it was by accident, it is, we're now moving into a period where I, mean, I feel as a journalist, it, it would be uh, both irresponsible and, and kind of no fun um, not to be covering this political moment, because it's just so interesting and I think important. And um, and it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a bonus that it also happens to be good business for us. Um, but I you know but I don't want it to completely overwhelm the rest of what we do. We do we have just invested 
um, a, a, a tremendous amount of um, resource. We have an amazing um, amount of talent doing cultural reporting. We have a site called Vulture, which is part of our um, part of our overall site, which is it's you know it's amazingly good entertainment site. And uh, and we're you know we have a fashion site which is is good and we're growing that too. So it's not it's not like we're becoming an all politics all the time. I'm going to steal um, uh, one of my last questions from the first question that we began the day with when <coughs> Ken Aletta asked uh, Vivek Kundro, I believe it was at the beginning, what would you do if you were the editor of the Boston Globe? I'm going to move it to New York. Um, you get a phone call tomorrow and say you have to take over the Times. There's no one, no <laughs> one else who can do it. Um, Jill acknowledges it herself, so she's, <laughs> she's handing you the key. So, can you anything that you've learned doing this, you know, with a very different audience in many ways, but similar in some ways, could it be applied to a major metropolitan paper, or specifically that major metropolitan paper uh, or major national paper? You know, I feel like the Times is kind of doing it. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, the the main the the, I mean, really, a lot of what we've done in New York is actually borrowed from the New York Times. Um, is uh, is trying to use the web. Uh, I mean, the great thing, one of the things, the amazing things about the New York Times is that it, in such a, a calcified print culture, um, when they started to uh, do content on the web, they just somehow changed their culture. They were liberated. They did all sorts of, you know, Dave Carr. Is Dave Carr? Is he still here? Um, you know, he 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 did wacko stuff that would just never this carpetbagger business that would just never ever be uh, allowed in the print part of the uh, in the paper. They they started to adapt. Um, they started to adapt to the kind of readership that you have in this other medium. While while not, I think I I, I think very I think they did that very successfully. While not losing the um, basic. Uh, um, mission objectives of the New York Times and not losing the New York Times' audience. So, you know, I would hate that job. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, um, I, won't, I won't give it to you, though. Uh, okay. but, but, uh, but, you know, but I think the Times does a pretty good, I think in that sense, I mean, if you're asking, in, in, I'm, not, I'm not sure entirely well, the well, sense you're asking. Let me, let, let me move it away from it. And one of the, the, to me, one of the distinctions, and maybe I, you, you could describe this as a shortcoming of your mm -hmm. political coverage, you cover politics, but you don't cover government that much. The Times has, it feels an obligation to have somebody covering right. the Justice Department, covering the Defense Departments. Are, are, are you shrinking from covering government? Do you think your readers aren't interested in covering, you don't have the resources for it, or do you think it doesn't make any difference? Well, I mean, you have to make choices. Um, you know, when I say that we're becoming more newspaper-like, uh, you know, I say that with one gigantic caveat, which is that um, we can be selective, highly selective. Uh, in what we cover, um, nobody n nobody feels uh, you know we don't we don't have that public trust burden um, of uh, covering everything. So we're very happy to have the New York Times, um, you know, co cover cover governmental process. Although I have to say that John Chait, for instance, does does some of that stuff, um, and we are kind of testing our readers to see how much they want. Um, you know, and if suddenly we found that, you know, people are absolutely fascinated with uh, parliamentary budget procedure, um, you know, we could start a little <coughs> blog on that. I think the European <laughs> community is the subject of the <laughs> interesting um, Well, it is actually, that's an interesting thing that, to say, which is that, you know, here, like, the Europe is huge, obviously, and, and, uh, and has so much impact on all the things that we write about, and yet, you know, we don't... Uh, you know, yeah. we're not well, covering the euro. Well, as a ma as a ma magazine, you 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 have the freedom to not have to do anything, really, right? Really, that's true. You, I mean, obviously, Except, you know, cover New York restaurants. New York do restaurants. Have to do when, that. When you, if you don't have New York restaurants, <laughs> you're in big trouble. Um, People are going to be pissed off. Um, so th there's the freedom of not having an obligation, but mm -hmm. uh, but would you sometimes think that maybe, as you move more and more in this direction, that you begin to develop an obligation? In other words. Uh, uh, an audience that begins to expect you to be a serious, important source on politics should lead you into, you know, maybe we need to, if not back off the restaurants, we can back off a few other things uh, and take on the civic responsibility that publications have. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think that that's possible. I think that's a long ways away, um, and uh, and I, you know, I, one, especially as you move digitally, people don't actually even see you. I mean, this is this is hardly a secret. But um, most of the ways people come to your content is not through your front door. Is that, that you know they're they're not looking at New York Magazine content. They're looking at a piece of content that New York Magazine happens to be publishing. So 
they're, you know, they're, they're taking that filleted content anyway. They're finding it through a link. They're finding it through a conversation that someone else is having about it. Um, you know, we have decent, uh, you know, decent readership of our, of our homepage, um, but like most uh, digital, uh, digital publications, um, most of the readers, you know, they, 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 they chase a single story or, or several. And, and, and then when you're there, you try to get them interested in the other stuff. But you know, often that's not even what they want. But uh, well, that was the next question. That if they're coming in to, to these portals that are really de designed mm -hmm. by subject matter, you're disaggregating the impact of it. You're being New York Magazine of, of having, which has been a very hard thing, very hard thing to get used to thing. as an editor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, as a magazine editor in particular, even more than as a newspaper editor. You are, your job has always been to create an environment, a whole very controlled environment where you want people to be in a certain um, you know, mood and state of mind. I mean, that's the sort of magic in, in many ways of the New Yorker, more than even just the quality of, of their journalism. It has a certain hum that people have uh, you know, always loved to read. You know, it's, it, it, and, um, and then you are in the digital you know, Wild West, and. Uh, and you just have to lose. You lose a sense of brand. I mean, your brand is brand is like okay. You're you're doing that because uh, it helps you organize how you what kind of journalism you do. Um, but uh, but in terms of, of how readers are coming to you, um, it's you know it's every piece for itself. Can you get to the place where you don't care? That that's fine so long as they're reading it. Um, I'm almost there. Yeah. I mean, it's been a lot of years, and uh, and you know, yeah. What do you ask of your people in terms of doing things? Uh, magazine writers, do they have to do stuff on, online as well? Do you ask them to tweet? Do you ask them to do? Um, we're pretty bad at asking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, and they're pretty temperamental about saying yes. OK, well, uh, <laughs> you're bad at asking. I'll then turn it to somebody else to do the asking. <laughs> okay. um, we've uh, uh, run through the first half of this and ready to take questions if anybody has them. Thanks, Dan. Um, I had a feeling you'd have. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do actually. When you when you introduced Adam, you talked about him taking the sort of the, this moribund model of the city magazine and turning it into something extraordinary. And what he really seems to have be moving toward now is a version of what you would think Time and Newsweek might be or might have become. Adam, when you look and when you take Dan's question about what would you do. Uh, and you look at Newsweek and you look at Time Magazine. How do you see those models? Do they, are there lessons that, that New York has uh, now learned that should have applied, could apply still to them? Are they, you know, is, is Newsweek still a viable creature now that it's merged with AOL? Um, not AOL, but uh, the Daily Beast, but yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I don't know whether Newsweek is viable over time. Um, uh, you know, Tina Brown is trying various things. Um, one thing she absolutely seems to be trying is to um, put a strong women's focus on it. And, uh, and, 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 and maybe as she plays that out, that will work. Um, that it, it doesn't try to be a, a conventional news magazine, but you know, a, a, a magazine that has a more sectored uh, readership. Um, you know, Time Magazine is, uh, is actually doing really well right now, bizarrely. You wouldn't, you, you, people have been predicting its demise for years and years and years. Um, and they, you know, they like, they sort of see themselves the same as the New York Times sees itself and, you know, as, uh, as a sort of more straightforward version of, um, you know, of its old self. Um, and doing a very active and, and in Times case, um, I think very also very good job online. Um, so you know we learn from them. Um, it you know we're 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 much more idiosyncratic than they are than either of them. Um, you know we sort of see our uh, our mandate because it's what our readers expect of us is having more fun. Um, you know we are as much as we see the sort of public trust. <coughs> part of what we do um, as important, we're also trying to give readers pleasure. Intellectual pleasure, we hope, and uh, other kinds of pleasure also. Um, but you should have a good time reading New York and its, uh, and, and its attendant parts. Um, you know, it's, it's not homework. Um, and, uh, and so I can maybe, in, in a sense, 
we see ourselves a little bit differently. Aren't you also, and then you, you, you and Mike, you. I'll shout, aren't you also uh, lucky that your circulation, you only need to have a half a million circulation, you don't need to make three million people happy? That is absolutely true. Um, and, uh, you know, and, 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 and the core is New York, New York City, uh, and the New York City sensibility, which is a very happy place. Um, what, what, what portion of the re readership is New York? Uh, in the mag, print, yeah. in print, it's uh, it's you know one third New York City proper, uh, one third the outlying areas, and one third national. Um, online, it's exactly the opposite. Um, yeah. Question. Identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm, I'm Diane McCorder. I'm a journalist. Hi, I'm over at the Radcliffe Institute, and I may be the only person here who wrote for seven days. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Thank you. Um, anyway, Adam, I wanted to, to know if you would comment on um, the effect that the move to digital has had on the quality of writing, and whether y this is something that you're, I, I mean, as a reader, I noticed that, um, you know, a really decline in the, abil the ability to sustain an argument. There's this sort of move to the, the aperçu. Um, and just kind of flabby, flatulent writing generally, even in shorter pieces. So I just wondered whether you've run into that and whether you have, um, it's hard for you to find uh, sort of uh, old fashioned magazine writers who can really, you know, keep up the quality. Well, I mean, I think what's happened is that there, um, there's just all kinds of writing uh, that, um, that, that plays out and there, you know, th and, and there are good and bad versions of each. Um, there are good, web writers and there are bad web writers. Um, there's a lot of people who can do kind of amazing things in 400 words um, or 800 words or, you know, I mean, ev everything is not micro, um, but, but things tend to be shorter and, uh, and people are good and bad at that the same way that, you know, uh, op-ed columnists at the New York Times or elsewhere are good or bad at that, at, you know, the 900 word form. Um, in terms of uh, long-form magazine writers, sure, it is harder to find good long-form magazine writers these days, but I don't blame the web, per se, for that. Um, I think that there's not a, um, there's not a whole mess of stepping stones um, where you learn to write you know, at an alternative weekly. There are fewer alternative weeklies. And then you um, move from there to writing for a smaller kind of magazine, and you move from there, et cetera. So there's th th that kind of apprenticeship of writing doesn't really happen. The magazines that are 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 uh, still existing for the most part. I mean, obviously, there's magazines like The Atlantic and 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 The New Yorker and and us. I hope, um, but a lot of people learn to write at um, at magazines where they're essentially doing celebrity profiles or they're writing about um, you know uh, writing confessional stuff, which uh, is fine. Well, but it creates it creates a different kind of where writer. Where do you find your new talent? Um, you know, you find it. Um, uh, you find it from other magazines. There's a lot of shared writers, I'm afraid to say, um, among magazines. You sometimes find it from newspapers, although uh, less and less. Um, our cover story on uh, Monday um, is written by a person who's never written a long-form magazine story before, and she was a she's a blogger for Daily Intel, one of the um, one of the blogs, and she you know she is used to writing at she's right at Slate. Um, and, but she's used to writing in 800 word forms and we gave her a 6,000 word subject to take on and she did a great job. So um, it's not- we'll, we'll be the judge of that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I've read it, you have. <laughs> yeah. Walter Shapiro, former Shortstein fellow, now at the New Republic, and someone who worked with Dan Okren at the Michigan Daily, a newspaper before the New York Times. <laughs> this is also the we first- We the 19th century. Uh, <laughs> This is also the first time in my life I've ever asked a question inspired by a Twitter feed. But looking at the feed up there, I realized, Adam, that your statement, we put up new content on the web every six minutes, has the potential to be famous. <laughs> because the way it was just picked up by thing after, person after person. So I want you to clarify, is that 240 items a day were you talking every six minutes during the working day? Is this Monday through Friday? Oh, all right. What, what are you, um, exactly, how do you get that number? Because it's about to take off. All right, <laughs> then I better clarify it fast. Uh, right. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's basically during, you know, it's basically during working, working hours. Um, it's, it, it, it probably starts at that speed at about, you know, 8.30 in the morning, uh, ending at about seven and then 
it lightens considerably from seven to seven in the morning. Um, but we still publish at that point, you know, maybe uh, maybe eight or nine things overnight. Um, and 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 the weekend has the same pattern as the overnights. So thank you for uh, asking me to clarify. What kind, of, what kind of attention does it get relative to copy that goes into the magazine? Number of pairs of eyes that see it, pencils on the, that touch it. Uh, online. Online. Wait, in turn, on the weekends and nights, <laughs> no, no, or no, no, in online. general? No. Um, well, I mean, you know, everything has a different size audience. Uh, 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 an individual blog post, if it, you know, if it gets 10,000 readers, that's really, um, that's a successful blog post for us. Um, you know, uh, a, magazine, a magazine article uh, online, you know, gets 200,000, 300,000, sometimes more. Well, what, what about the eyeballs that are applied to it before it gets posted? In, in other words, the, the, the What's the editing the, process? The editing process online and, and um, the editing process online is zero, uh, pretty much. Um, and a, a set of eyes looks at it um, very fast, um, but basically people are responsible for um, their own content. Sometimes the stuff gets revised after it's put up, um, if a mistake has been made. Um, but you know, it's on to the next thing. Um, and and you know, if someone's publishing a, a bunch of crap, they won't be allowed to do that again. But we, um, but we don't stop it before it goes up. But that, doesn't that suggest that maybe those of us who, who are used to dead tree journalism have been obsessing about the wrong things? Uh, too many editors uh, trust your writers to do the work that they do. Um, and if they don't do it well, get new writers. I mean, if, if you feel confident putting your brand, your name, on work that doesn't get edited, why not the same for the magazine? Well, two reasons. One is. Um, the magazine work is more complex, um, and actually, the editor-writer relationship is, um, uh, you know, turns out turns out to be more important, and and does actually change. I mean, stuff changes enormously from first draft to uh, to publication. Um, you know, I I the stuff is. I'm talking particularly about you know the long form stuff. The, you know, six thousand word stories really worked on really a lot. Now. It, are, are editors necessary? Is that your question? Um, I would say yes. Maybe maybe they're overpriced. I'm not sure I'd make that argument, um, but I I I could I can hear it. I can see it. Um, I think the uh, you know and I and I have to say that I'm not that comfortable um, with stuff that goes up without editing. But the, the, that but that's the practical reality. Um, is that that um, that it's a, it's a speed it's a speed business. Um, and uh, and I've gotten used to over time. Um, you know, we don't we don't screw up very much. You know, we publish some stuff that I don't love sometimes, but we publish a lot of, a lot of stuff that I do, and a lot of stuff maybe even that would be caught and and not published by editors um, who are being too cautious or not not cautious, but being too kind of conservative about what they think the readers are interested. You can also in. destroy what you put up online that you don't like. You can get it offline very quickly, right? No. <laughs> I mean, you can change stuff, but yeah, I mean, you know, famously, everything online is there forever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm Bill Lanouette. I was a fellow here in 1988. And uh, I have a question about uh, the comparison that's being made here uh, with The New Yorker and The Atlantic uh, being serious magazines that sometimes have big pieces. What's the role today? Uh, I know The New Yorker and the Atlantic both have a rigorous fact-checking process. What, what is fact-checking like in New York, and might it change if you take on more substantive stuff? Well, we do, you know, we fact-check uh, the magazine just as thoroughly as, uh, you know, just as thoroughly as um, uh, probably the Atlantic, and maybe not as, as the New Yorker, but, but pretty thoroughly. Um, and we don't fact-check uh, stuff online, but it gets it gets fact checked in essence um, by the readers, who will correct it very very fast if you've made a mistake. But you know the uh, an interesting parallel question had to do you know at the New York Times, um, I worked at the New York Times Magazine, we had a rigorous fact checking uh, procedure. The newspaper doesn't. <laughs> the newspaper has no fact checking. They they rely on reporters to do their own. Uh, to do their own work, and it's, there's some there's some minor fact checking that copy editors do, but it's uh, it's essentially not fact checked. It's a system that's worked pretty well um, over time, uh, and um, 
you know, Michael Kinsley used to have a uh, famous um, belief, and, and, and he put it into practice in the places that he edited, that all fact checkers were unnecessary, and it was, uh, and they just made writers lazy. Um, there was that wonderful story of Kinsley's. He was interviewed by William Sean at the New Yorker, who was interested in hiring him, and they began to talk about fact checking, and Sean said, <coughs> well, you know, if it's in your manager of the New Republic, you know, we consider that trustworthy, and that that's fact checked. And Michael thought, shit, we make this stuff up. <laughs> 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 Nick Gowing, I get the feeling you're feeling quite confident about a sustainable business model emerging at the moment in terms of patterns of readership, how people are accessing uh, your, your output, when they access it, generationally as well. Or am I being a bit over-optimistic or seeing a framework emerging which you're not so confident in? In other words, do you think you've now got a framework which will be sustainable through the next year or two and possibly sustainable for longer? when it comes to all these variables and imponderables that everyone's debating at the moment? I'll give you a year. I think I feel confident about you know a year. <laughs> but if you're asking me if I'm confident whether this is sustainable over five years, 10 years, I would be nuts to say that uh, I feel confident about that. But do you that. think no you've identified cares. trends which are now uh, pretty consistent? Uh, th there are trends that are working for us right now. Um, there are trends that are like still growing. Um, and, uh, and so I, you know, I feel we're going in the right direction. Um, but uh, this business is changing so fast. People's reading habits and consumption of, of media uh, is changing so fast. Adver the advertising business, which really, we are still in the advertising business as a, as a, as a business model question. Um, we don't charge for any, you know, we charge for the magazine, but that's actually a you know, very minor part of, of our revenue. Essentially, we are supported by people who want to advertise to our readers. And, and I think the advertising business is, um, is even, even greater upheaval uh, than, the, uh, than the journalism business. Um, so I couldn't predict uh, you know, whether that aspect of what we do is Prediction is not what quite what I was asking, Com whether, you're, whether you're feeling increasingly comfortable I'm I'm that a degree of stability is emerging in the patterns. Yeah, I mean, I, I do feel, I feel stable about readership right now. Um, obviously, uh, I feel very nervous about the economy. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody does. Uh, you know, if it, if it drops again, as it did uh, three years ago, um, you know, that's, that's tough for us because it's expensive to do what we do. Um, so reasonably confident, a Adam, little confident. Let me ask one more. I mean, when it comes to this and digital, or digital advertising, yeah. mm -hmm. I work at the BBC and we're, we're mm -hmm. getting commercial revenues, significant commercial revenues around the world now from the digital platforms as opposed to our license fee funded mm -hmm. stuff. And we're seeing a significant change now. I'm not in this in that side of the business, obviously, because mm -hmm. there's a firewall between the journalism and the commercial side. But there, there's a there's a there's a, a clarity that of a degree of confidence now in among the advertisers that what you see digitally on something like this now does have enormous potential, possibly well beyond the traditional forms of linear advertising. Well, I mean, you know, our digital business is fantastically. Um, strong at the moment. Um, you know, there, uh, there are other kinds of digital businesses that we're, we're just starting to experiment with, iPad kinds of things. What would happen if you started to charge for digital content, even if you charge very little? We don't know. Um, Talk about it? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I think are it's... Are we all waiting for the, to see whether the, the Times' effort is going to work and then... Times and other magazine models. Um, you know, I think you're where everybody's looking at everybody else um, to see what ultimately people will be willing to pay for. I mean, we're different from other magazine digital operations in that we have a successful digital advertising business. People want to advertise so that we actually need the eyeballs. Um, you know, places like uh, you know Condé Nast, um, they were sort of late in getting to the game, so that they are um, they're much more comfortable. Um, getting people to pay for material online because there's no advertising risk for us. There obviously is. We, you know, we we don't want to lose the momentum of our readership um, because we can still make money off of them. Also, we like them. Adam, <laughs> can I can I ask one more question yeah. of, of you? 
you're, you've become, and uh, you know, don't deny it, you've become an iconic figure in the magazine business. You really have. You've been so successful. I do deny I'm, it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, well, deny, deny it. it. You deny it, too? <laughs> well, okay. I guess my, qu but my question to you is this. You are the editor of a weekly magazine. What is your r job now? I mean, what, what do you spend your time, just in a percentage-wise, doing? Um... Well, you know, a lot of what I do is edit the weekly magazine still. I, you know, uh, work with a very talented bunch of editors and writers to figure out what we should publish in the magazine this week, work with the photographers and, and figure out the cover and all of that stuff. Um, I'm more hands-on about that part. Then I um, oversee the digital part where there's huge, uh, other hugely talented people who actually know a whole mess more than I do. Um, about what they're doing, and I listen to them, and I try to guide them and direct them, and um, and and sort of move the thing strategically, as opposed to actually edit copy. Or I I read I read uh, I read the stuff we publish at the same pace um, that anyone else does. Usually at night, I will sit there and read everything we've published all day, um, but I will not have seen most of it before. I worry about personnel because personnel is huge, particularly online. Personnel is huge. You're trusting. You're really trusting. Um, you're giving them the keys to the car they're driving, um, and so you have to be picking the right people for that. I spend a lot of time worrying about that. Uh, you know, I worry about um, the large strategic questions of how people read and how people are going to read and whether we should, you know, what we exactly should be doing on the tablet and that sort of thing. I, you know, and like, but like most jobs like this, what do I do? Personnel, management. You know, it's like you, you, you uh, dream of having jobs like this for a long time because you think it's all going to be sort of journalistic fun. But actually what it is is that you're, you know, you're in charge of uh, a lot of uh, talented people's happiness. And um, that's the hard part. <laughs> and that doesn't change no matter what. I think we've got it. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Mm.